Good morning. Welcome. Uh, my name is Andrea Prabattoni. Welcome to the last session of, uh, of this workshop. The general topic of this session uh, will be ultra fast dynamics in clusters and nanostructures. We will have uh, three speakers. I immediately introduce the first speaker, is Daniela Rupp from ATH in Zurich. And uh, she will tell us about uh, ultra fast dynamics in clusters followed with the coherent diffraction imaging. Please, Daniela, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Andreas. Can you all see my slides? I think so, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, welcome everyone. I will uh, talk today about ultra fast dynamics in clusters followed with coherent diffraction imaging and um, start with coherent, no? Coherent diffractive imaging as um, a vision that drove the um, uh, the development and uh, building of those large scale facilities, free electron lasers in the X-ray regime, diffraction before destruction. So the concept uh, you may probably know, um, a single isolated uh, biomolecule with interesting um, properties uh, in life sciences maybe is um, introduced into vacuum and irradiated with an intense uh, coherent X-ray pulse. And the photons are then elastically scattered by the electrons bound to the atoms and they cast uh, um, interference pattern, a so-called coherent diffraction pattern, which contains the structural information uh, of the particle. And uh, this can be calculated back by um, uh, computer algorithms and then because the um, high amount because of the high amount of energy which is deposited into uh, the biomolecule it will quickly explode after the interaction but the idea the the um, ideal vision is that uh, the diffraction happens before destruction however it's um, already clear when you think about it that uh, the diffraction which happens during the pulse is always accompanied also by ionization which happens during the pulse. So there is, even with the shortest pulses, a part of uh, radiation damage that cannot be avoided and will always uh, be present in the diffraction image. So um, ultra-fast radiation damage was uh, quickly identified as one of the bottlenecks of um, this method and um, therefore X-ray matter interaction studies were already from the beginning in the focus of um, X-ray free electron laser science and one way to do that is use um, atomic clusters as nano labs. So um, you reduce the complexity of the uh, target system in order to see the dynamics you're interested in uh, most clearly. And um, one thing that you can do, for example, with clusters also to uh, use a single cluster and do the same thing as we just uh, seen before. So do coherent diffraction imaging on that cluster, which will give you a much more simple um, interference pattern with uh, so, uh, such rings, if the cluster is, for example, a sphere, or if there are other shapes present, you will see uh, uh, those in the diffraction images. And we can, for example, learn about the shapes of clusters and how they grow. Um, for the uh, spherical, uh, very simple model systems, we can use the information from the diffraction images to sort uh, the data for size. So here you can see, for example, uh, different sizes uh, from very uh, the very large clusters cast uh, more fine um, diffraction rings and the smaller cluster clusters wider diffraction rings. For one cluster size, you can um, uh, distinguish between different FEL intensities. So what, what typically happens is that the cluster is at different focal positions and so it's irradiated at different intensities. And this can be used then to um, sort um, other reaction products which are measured together with the diffracted light from coming from a single cluster um, on this information size and intensity, which gives a very deep insight into the X-ray matter interaction. Then, of course, um, one can add uh, pump probe schemes. So um, come in, for example, now with uh, another um, 
uh, X-ray pulse and do um, diffraction on the already evolved system, so time-resolved diffraction of light-induced dynamics, ranging from uh, femtoseconds to picoseconds or uh, even longer. And one example uh, that we uh, rather recently did um, was um, using an optical laser to melt um, uh, individual silver clusters and then observe uh, the melting process uh, on the time scale of picoseconds and even nanoseconds. The key um, aspect of coherent diffractive imaging of clusters, which I want to um, uh, base uh, this talk on, is the fact that um, the um, electronic structure, of course, changes during the interaction in the cluster as well as in the biomolecule. We have ionization, we have plasma formation, and this will change the scattering response. And therefore, there can be a, a trace of the electronic structure, which transiently is changed, can be um, extracted also from the diffraction image. So um, what we want to use is radiation damage read backwards. We want to use diffraction imaging as a spatial temporary resolve probe for ultrafast dynamics. And um, uh, this is also uh, very well supported by the recent developments at uh, light sources, so at free electron lasers, uh, like uh, Fermi, for example, uh, and also at flash, we have multicolor uh, uh, schemes uh, to do time-resolved studies with two X-ray pulses of different wavelengths. Um, uh, as I will also show later in the talk, we can use also intense pulses from laser-based high harmonic generation sources for single particle imaging and uh, the ultra short pulses uh, available now even um, will allow us to uh, reach for attosecond imaging of electronic processes. Now, um, let's first uh, look into how and where can electronic changes be imaged best. So we already clarified that electron dynamics are encoded in the diffracted light because it's the electrons bound to the system which do the scattering. If the electronic structure changes, the scattering will change. Strong changes will be observed at resonant or close to resonant photon energies. I will talk about two examples now. One is xenon clusters at uh, 91 EV um, photon energy, which is um, a region for a special region for xenon so it's um, where the giant resonance is so uh, many electrons in the uh, xenon electronic structure are there um, uh, resonantly can there re be resonantly ionized and so um, uh, what you can read down here in this graph is the absorption cross section um, of xenon, so atomic ions, but um, uh, as a starting point that also will work for the cluster. And then uh, over charge state, so neutral xenon at 91 EV has a rather high absorption cross section of about 25 megabarn. And this uh, is also the same for, or approximately the same for one plus, two plus, and three plus. Four plus uh, uh, at 91 EV, we hit a very strong resonance up, uh, up to 200 megabar and even and then the higher charge states five plus six plus seven plus are um, uh, almost transparent at that photon energy and so um, this already uh, lets us expect that there uh, we will have um, strong changes in the electronic structure that can be observed at that wavelength the other example I will talk about are helium and nano droplets. And there we look in the energy region around 21.5 EV, where the excitation of um, atomic helium from 1s2 to 1s2p is located. And then it's a bit shifted uh, because we are in a droplet. So what we can see here is the, uh, is the um, uh, refractive index of helium uh, liquid, so measured um, in bulk helium. And we can see here uh, there's a strong absorption and the refraction is also uh, showing uh, strong changes. And uh, uh, the solid line up here is a calculation on how strong uh, do droplets scatter at the different photon energies in that range. And we see very strong differences. And up here we see uh, different simulations um, based on 
those parameters um, from liquid helium for helium droplets of the same size of a radius of 400 nanometers. And we see strong changes just by changing the photon energy in that range. And therefore we think, uh, or, or we, we assume um, that um, in this region, um, changes of the electronic structure will also lead to strong changes in the diffraction and we may be able to observe that. So let's see. The first um, uh, uh, result I want to present is the result on the xenon clusters where we showed that we can actually spatially resolve to some extent ultrafast electron dynamics when they come from when they come from ionization. So here we see two examples of um, xenon clusters irradiated uh, at 91 eV of a size of uh, approximately 400 nanometer radius. And uh, then one can um, integrate around and, uh, and take out a radial profile from the center to the higher uh, scattering angles. And we see those uh, small fringes which come from um, the uh, outer diameter of the particle, but we also see another structure uh, showing up here for the more intense patterns. And um, uh, a simple um, idea can be gained from uh, this picture here. So if you have um, not uh, a full um, uh, aperture, for example, or um, uh, a full sphere, but just a ring um, that scatters light. Then you will get a pattern um, like shown here with um, the maxima and minima here corresponding to the um, outer diameter of the ring and the superstructure, the modulation corresponding to the thickness of the ring. So how can we uh, think of a, a ring scattering here in the case of a fully solid uh, xenon cluster. So uh, this we can explain by a basic photo ionization model. So if we just think of what does this special um, uh, I, uh, absorption cross section as a function of charge state mean for the ionization. So if we just consider photo ionization um, uh, with photons coming in from the surface, falling on the cluster and then propagating into the cluster shell by shell or atomic layer by atomic layer, then of course, because of the high um, absorption cross sections for neutral and low charge states, they will be soon absorbed and um, uh, uh, therefore a highly charged outer layer evolves. So we can see here in the calculation that um, uh, an outer layer evolves, which is only highly charged and the inner part is still pretty much neutral. So of course, if we think about this, um, the side view of this cluster will mean that if the photons are coming from the front, we will uh, develop something like um, such a crescent shape of highly charged uh, clusters. But if you think, how does this, uh, does this look from the front? Um, you will get something like um, a concentric uh, core shell system. And we can um, apply such a concentric core shell system by using me core shell um, fitting. And um, me theory allows us to extract optical constants from a sphere and therefore we can extract the refractive index. And this we have done on a data set of approximately 100 um, uh, radius 400 nanometer clusters. And you can see all the radial profiles here and you can see that this development of this additional modulation is somehow encoded in all of those um, profiles. And in order to get rid of um, all the shape differences and so on, we pack them into categories. So yellow, green, light blue and dark blue, A, B, C, D, and average the profiles. Now, this is, of course, not a time-resolved experiment. So we just have one pulse that irradiates the particle. And the assumption that we do now for the analysis is, is that there's a common dynamics happening for all the events. So if the cluster, if the diffraction image is darker, then the cluster was not irradiated by so many photons, but it went through all the processes up to a certain point. And if there is more light coming in, it will go through the same processes and then just move on in the evolution. And therefore, we separated intensity steps by analyzing the differences between uh, the profile C, uh, D, B, and A. So this is shown here. 
the difference profiles, they also show uh, even a bit more stronger the modulation, and we can fit those uh, with me core shell fitting, and then look at the parameters that we get out of this fit. And uh, the results are given here, and uh, we see that uh, the delta of the shell and the beta of the shell are different to the delta and beta of neutral uh, xenon. And um, the result is uh, visualized here. So um, uh, seeing from the front and outer shell uh, evolves, which gets thicker and thicker. And um, the, uh, while the uh, absorption of the outer shell is simply reduced, the refraction changes um, drastically uh, in that um, evolution. Okay, so um, the key message here is that it's possible to track to some extent the spatial distribution of a certain charge state and we can film plasma formation. Now the uh, second uh, result that I want to discuss is uh, uh, based on um, a high harmonic generation experiment. So we are using extreme ultraviolet pulses from an intense high harmonic generation source. So the uh, chair of the session may recognize the design here in the center because he was involved in developing that microfocusing optic. Um, we did the experiment at the Max Born Institute in Berlin, where we used um, a, a Titan Sapphire uh, uh, laser pulse uh, around uh, 12 millijoule, 35 femtosecond with xenon as a gas. Um, and to produce the high harmonic pulses. And then we filtered out the infrared and focused the XUV into a micron, uh, about 10 micron spot, which gave us something like 10 to the 12 watts per square centimeters. And we could um, uh, measure uh, bright, clearly structured diffraction patterns of single helium nano droplets. And we could also analyze those uh, droplets with me, th me with me fitting. And there we have to take into account, of course, that high harmonic generation pulses are multicolor pulses. So we have to introduce the harmonics into the fitting. And there uh, it appeared very difficult to uh, do a proper fitting or uh, to know which fit um, is uh, correct when the intensities of the harmonics were not measured shot to shot. So in the next upgrade of this experiment, we also added a single shot XV spectrometer. So to have the single shot um, contributions of the high harmonics in order to put that into the fitting. And then we did um, in a second and third step um, time resolved experiments where we added um, an optical laser to the experiment. So um, an, a moderate uh, intensity laser on the order of 10 to the 12 watts per square centimeter, which by itself is not strong enough to uh, ionize uh, the helium droplet, um, uh, is um, overlapped with the XUV or precedes it or follows it. And what we then observe is th those are um, the brightest pattern of uh, each delay. So here you can see the delay from minus 150 femtosecond to plus 150 femtosecond. And in the overlap region, we see a clear decrease of the intensity of the patterns. So the diffraction decreases when the IR laser is present. And um, uh, from calculations, we find that um, the uh, optical laser dresses the atoms at least uh, that's how one would say for um, atomic gas. So let's keep that uh, nomenclature also for the droplet. The droplet is laser addressed and the levels are shifted and also new transitions are opened. So there are transient changes of the diffraction response introduced by the optical laser. And in a very recent experiment, this is only preliminary uh, data that I can show here. We did, uh, we repeated the experiment with uh, much better timing conditions. So while we had um, an XUV pulse here uh, on the order of several uh, tens of femtoseconds, and as well as um, an IR pulse here, we have um, an IR pulse on the order of eight femtoseconds and the XUV pulse uh, accordingly shorter and um, uh, a high timing stability. So we also could see a decrease on the order of 30% uh, in intensity in the overlap region and a fine scan in the overlap region even showed subcycle dynamics so a two omega oscillation. With this, I would like to summarize my talk and give a, an outlook. 
I hope I could show you with those two examples that coherent diffractive imaging is sensitive to changes in the electronic structure of matter. The contrast can be found best in the vicinity of electronic resonances or absorption edges. We could observe the plasma formation in resonantly excited xenon clusters, which results in an outer shell of highly charged transparent ions. And this shell is several tens to up to hundreds of nanometers thick. And uh, we could uh, switch the uh, response of helium droplets with a non-ionizing IR. And then I would just put that into the future. There's the possibility to trace charge states, excited states, nonlinear dynamics, coherent electron dynamics, charge density waves, think whatever you like best in time and space. And for this, we are developing now the tools. So uh, we are, for example, trying to get a, a more um, controlled helium droplet source um, where we can really have the same droplet uh, all the time. And for example, for the time resolved studies, we set up and demonstrated uh, way to do two color uh, CDI movies with only two frames, but at least so two times the same cluster is imaged with two different wavelengths. And yeah, so exciting physics ahead of us. Many people involved. I would like to acknowledge all of their contributions and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Daniela, for the, for the great talk. And uh... Now the session is, is open for, for questions. I remind you to the audience that you can post questions in the Q&A session. Or you can also ask me after lunch in the, yes. um, the in, in these the break breakout rooms. Room, in the breakout room that we will have after lunch, sure. And uh, maybe I, I can start with a question concerning the first part of your talk, that is uh, the experiment that you did on Xenon. And uh, if I properly understood, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but you use only one pulse, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, and and basically, you retrieve the time information uh, through the the, the the intensity profile. Yeah, it's not a time information really. So. Um... Uh, what you would need to do to get a real time information would be, for example, to, to um, uh, vary the pulse duration and then you could uh, get insight in. Um, so uh, uh, our explanation of uh, this um, outer shell, which is more or less transparent, is coming from a pure photoionization model. At the same time, you will also have um, plasma dynamics in the cluster, uh, collisional processes and so on. And this sharp edge between a transparent outer shell and a still highly absorbing inner core only exists if you keep still, uh, if you keep clearly to just photo ionization. So as soon as you have plasma dynamics, this will smooth out and therefore this will clearly change the, um, um, the, um, modulation that we observe. And so I think it will be very interesting to do experiments also with different pulse durations to get a real time information. But would you choose to do different pulse duration with a single pulse or really go to, to a pump probe? You can, you can also uh, try to go to pump probe, but of course um, you will again have the problem that you have most of the time with such pump probe approaches that you superimpose the pump image with the probe image and you have to deal with that. But maybe one, would, could, one could still do that, for example, excite with one wavelength and then probe with another wavelength and uh, try to get a contrast for both wavelengths and then separate them with filters. So it's, um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff ahead. Thank you very much. I don't see. Uh, questions yet in the. In the Q&A session and. Maybe I, I ask a second question a bit more general and uh, con with respect to let's say conventional X-ray diffraction, you use uh, relatively low photon energy. And uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you commented about the fact that, uh, of course, in this case, you would like to be resonant with, uh, with the properties of the target. And maybe you can comment in general uh, okay. about maybe the advantage or disadvantages, of course, of using uh, low yeah. energy diffraction. So I would say um, 
it's there is no distinction that we have to do um that we can only do this in the XOV regime and it, it's not transferable to the X-ray regime. I think it's just, um, I mean, there is currently no high harmonic generation source which can uh, produce sufficiently intense X-ray pulses or soft X-ray mm -hmm. pulses to do a uh, single uh, uh, particle imaging. So if we want to make use of the nice temporal and spectral um, characteristics of um, uh, high harmonic generation sources, then we are bound to the x ray regime as of now. But uh, the other second pulses are coming up everywhere and um, they are also coming in the x ray regime. And right now there are no light sources where we have really like um, face locked infrared to other second X-rays. But I, I think this will be, uh, this will come. And then um, uh, I think the, um, Coherent diffraction imaging of electronic structures will always be close to resonances where you can get contrast or close to transient resonances where you get the contrast. So I think the concept is just transferable. It's uh, the place where we uh, at the moment get clear signal, strong signal, but it's not limited. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, we have a, a question from Francesca. Thanks, oh. Daniela, for the talk. In the case of Xenon, could you consider non-collinear schemes to overcome pump and probe overlap, or would that be not possible for imaging? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we also uh, thought about um, such schemes that you uh, come in from two sides and you basically, um, uh, one, one pulse does the um, uh, excitation and then another one does the imaging and there you have no problem to separate the images because you can just put it in two detectors. It's not easy to do. We have uh, done one experiment where we just came in from, from two sides. Of course, you then need to get your timing information very precisely because yeah. the, the cluster position is always different. And then the timing between the two pulses is very difficult to keep constant. So you would have to have a very good um, additional measurement where the one interaction was. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's uh, possible and uh, it's doable, but it's um, a challenge, a experimentally a challenge. Good. Are there any other questions? If yes, please post in the Q&A session. I don't see for now any, any other questions, so I would really thank Daniel again. For thank for you, Andrea. Thank and you, Andrea, and see you. everyone else later. Bye. Okay. And uh, we can continue with, uh, with the second talk of, uh, of the session. It will be provided by Thais Gorg Hover and uh, she will tell us about X-ray imaging at the nanoscale with at a second time resolution. So please, Thais, stage is yours. Okay, do you see me? Do you hear me? Hello? We hear you. You are at least to me frozen in that. No, now I can also see you clearly. And and uh, hello, I hello. can see your slides. Um, okay, yes. Do, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Ah, okay, good. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, sorry for the difficulties. I just was not aware. I could not find the, the website anymore. Um, so hi, I'm I'm Thais. Um, I'm a, a, I'm a professor at the University of Hamburg, 
And today I want to talk to you about experiments we did um, at LCLS. Um, and these are two experiments, one with soft attosecond X-ray pulses and one with hard X-ray pulses. Um, and they both are dedicated to developing uh, X-ray diffraction imaging techniques. Um, so Daniela already uh, provided you a really nice introduction why diffraction bef uh, before destruction principle, coherent X-ray diffraction with FELs uh, has amazing capabilities. This is just a reminder that um, this method is particularly interesting because it allows us uh, to image nanoparticles with really high temporal and spatial resolution. And it's quite unique compared to other methods just because it, it can, the experiments can be done at ambient conditions, so at room temperature, at any pressure. Um, it provides images of individual nanoparticles and we, have, we can have really short exposure time. So in principle, we can combine uh, atomic resolution with, with femtosecond or even attosecond resolution. And um, there have been predictions. Um, this is just one um, which I will be showing, but there are many very interesting uh, uh, theoretical papers which predict that in principle, with the FEL um, settings we have now available for users, it should be possible to um, record images of heavy atom uh, nanoparticles with atomic resolution. So this is, for example, a pretty recent uh, study uh, conducted by Fei Ho. So he, he simulated it for argon clusters um, and fluxes of 10 to 12 photons per square micron, which is more or less what we have um, at, at many facilities across the world. Um, and as you can see, um, there is a prediction that, the, that we, um, we could achieve atomic resolution. Uh, right, you see one of the most recent experiments. Um, so this is just to mention behind this experiment, there's a lot of um, other groups and, and work which has been done, uh, the SBI um, imaging initiative. So this is just one kind of representative, one of their most recent results published by Kartik Ayer. And uh, what you can see here are images of gold nanoparticles. And as you can see, the resolution is higher than, than one nanometer, clearly. Uh, it's, I, th I believe it's something like two nanometers. So the question is, why is there this uh, discrepancy? And uh, we always had the suspicion that the, the, the pulse duration might play a role because usually people really try to um, pack as many photons as possible um, as many photons produce very bright images. However, uh, this comes usually at a cost of, sh of, of long pulses and then uh, sample damage, structural sample damage can already manifest itself. So we did a very systematic study. Um, uh, we um, uh, recorded a large data set on xenon clusters. We went into the soft X-ray regime, so one nanometer wavelength. Um, and um, uh, we illuminated single clusters, which were 80 to 100 nanometers uh, 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 size. So what you can see here, what I will be showing you here is similarly sized clusters. So they are, they differ maybe by one nanometer in, in diameter. Um, and we recorded diffraction images further downstream using single FAL pulses, similarly as Daniela has described. But um, we used just a single pulse and we varied the pulse duration. So we started with, with the pulse duration, which was previously used mostly by SPI experiments at, um, at LCLS. This was around 100 to 200 femtoseconds. Um, and this was the brightness we achieved. So when we went to five femtosecond pulses, which have 10 times less photons in the pulse duration, um, we expected just 10 times less bright images. Uh, and we were extremely surprised uh, when we noticed that this is absolutely not the case. What we noticed, in fact, is that the images are 100 times brighter than the 200 femtosecond images. And you can clearly see this that the higher scattering angles, they truly start to emerge. So this is really an image which has a better resolution than the upper image. Um, so we got really intrigued and we started digging deep, deeper 
um, and I will show you what, what we've done, the, the detailed analysis, but I would also already like to tell you the message of this analysis. So the message of this analysis is that um, the, the um, 200 femtosecond image is that 10 times less bright compared to literature values. And in contrast, um, five femtosecond exposures um, they are 10 times brighter compared to literature values. And literature values uh, uh, means scattering cross-section, which you find from synchrotron measurements or just uh, linear theory. Um, so we compared with those. Um, so they are basically two effects. Um, and so when we started simulating um, the situation, because once we saw it, of course, we first started digging if we made a mistake in the experiment, but we couldn't find any. And then we asked Faye from the Argonne National Lab to um, simulate the situation. And what his simulations brought to light is that um, our results can be explained using transient resonances. Um, and transient resonances, um, you can find the following. So um, imagine this is a xenon atom, and uh, that's the distance from the core. And this is the Coulomb potential here uh, on this side of the, uh, on the y-axis. And this is the orbital, um, the distinct orbitals, which contribute um, to, to, um, to, to, to resonance scattering. Um, and, um, so here, just uh, examples, we, the, the experiments were conducted in the vicinity of the 3D resonance. So imagine you have 3D electrons um, and in resonance is a two photon process basically so that the, reson the electron is going up into the unoccupied orbital and then going back down. And this is what, what makes uh, it resonance scattering. And the strength of this transition it depends on the overlap, on the spatial overlap of the orbitals. So here you see the core level, the 3D level, it's closer to the core as you would expect. And the 4F, this is an outer shell weakly bound orbital. Um, so this is much, much further out and they barely overlap spatially. And this is why usually X-ray scattering, resonance scattering cross section is not that high. There's just simply a small spatial overlap. Uh, now, the situation changes quite dramatically um, if you scatter off a charged um, particle. So here, um, um, one of the core electrons, so one of the 3D electrons is removed, um, and then you get two effects. One is really more or less intuitive, I believe, because once you remove one electron, uh, the remainder, remaining electrons, they are... Uh, uh, bound much more strongly. So the entire resonant transition shifts to higher energy. So if you just look at the delta E, basically between 3D and 4F, it, it, it will be greater. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, but then there's another thing which happens. And the thing is that all the orbitals are also pulled closer to the core center. That does not affect that much the inner shells um, a little bit but it does affect the inner, the, the outer shells, as you can see, so the, the 4F orbital. And now in this situation, they began to overlap and the, the overlap uh, increases dramatically. And now if you just use this Hartree-Fox simulation, we, 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 so we use the Hartree-Fox simulation to, um, um, to calculate this, this shift I was just presenting to you. And now you take this simulation and you record the scattering cross-section uh, what you will see is the following. Um, so the um, um, here, what you what you see is the photon energy, so the incoming X-ray photon energy, and this is the calculated scattering cross section. Um, so for the neutral case, so this is what I call literature value, or this is the new, new, uh, the synchrotron. Uh, type measurement, what you would expect is a, a cross section uh, like this. Uh, the shape of the resonance, there, the, it's, there's a 3D level splitting and you can see this. Um, now, if you do the same thing for the xenon one plus with a 
core hole, um, suddenly the cross section, because of the large overlap between the orbitals, increases dramatically. Um, in fact, in this case, it's by two orders of magnitude. And um, this is definitely uh, one of the mechanisms why we see that our images are brighter than, than we would expect. And um, the thing is that people have already found um, this type of transient resonances in absorption and even in imaging. So here's um, one publication um, by Elliot Kanter. Um, this, this is already 10 years old, uh, where they looked at um, absorption spectra from neon. And um, this is a calculation basically of the absorption cross section near the resonance and the resonance uh, the uh, neutral resonant transition is around here and around 840 and you barely see it but now if you look at the absorption cross-section for one and two and three plus uh, they they increase dramatically um, and again this might seem a bit counterintuitive because what you would always expect is if you have less electrons um, you would have a, a lesser scattering cross-section or absorption cross-section but in case of transient resonances, exactly the opposite is the case. Um, and here's the trick. So absorption and scattering, they're interconnected. They are two sides of the same metal. Now, it's not that simple in the case of, uh, of uh, coherent diffractive imaging because absorption will always drive up um, the destruction of the sample. Um, so that means that once you um, excite transient resonances, you get more and more absorption, there's more and more energy dumped into the nanoparticle and the explosion of the nanoparticle, which is really bad for your images, it, it accelerates and it can happen already on really short time scales. And this is basically what previous imaging studies by uh, Christoph, Christoph Bosch, Daniel Rupp and, and Fay has shown that with long pulses um, and in the XUV region, they are mostly detrimental effects from transient resonances for imaging. So the message here is, if you want to explore transient resonances, we need really short pulses. And we literally see this in our statistics. So we see this in our data. Um, um, that's, this graph is a bit complicated, but I, I will try to explain the main message. So on the left, what you see uh, is our calibration data. So we looked all uh, at all the um, uh, uh, images we recorded, which were 20, 30, 40,000. Um, and we looked, um, we, we, we uh, uh, basically calculated the scattering cross-section, something which is proportional, directly proportional to the scattering cross-section, um, and plotted it versus something which is proportional to the absorption cross-section, namely the uh, fluorescence photon yield. And um, the fluorescence photon yield, this gray line, what you see is, is what you would get just from uh, literature values again. So usually one, when one xenon atom absorbs a single X-ray photon, the probability uh, of emitting a fluorescence photon is about 10 to minus three. Um, and what we see is once we crank up the intensity, the scattering goes up, um, but of course also the fluorescence yield. Now, if you go to long pulses, um, if you go to long pulses, at some point the scattering does not increase anymore. It only fluorescence increases. So that means that the sample becomes transparent. And this is a very dramatic effect here. And this is where we lose the order uh, of 10 of magnitude. Um, so this is for the 200 femtosecond pulses. Now, far above the resonance, when you really hit the transient resonances and you use short pulses such as five femtoseconds, um, what you see is all another dramatic effect. What you see is that the fluorescence yield goes more than two orders of magnitude above the literature value. So you have heavy absorption, um, but it rises together with the scattering. And the reason is that the particle within five femtoseconds, the atoms still don't move. But that also again emphasizes that it's really important to have short pulses um, to, um, uh, to exploit transient resonances for imaging. Um, and here on the right, what you see is based on the fluorescence calibration. Um, this is 
our calculation of the absolute scaling cross section we observe. Again, plotted here, this is the X-ray incoming X-ray energy, and this is the scattering cross-section. And what you can see for short pulses and far above the resonance, you see an order of magnitude and increase in scattering cross-section. Meanwhile, for 200 femtosecond pulses, which are much more intense, um, you lose an order of magnitude in scattering cross-section because, um, because the, the, the particle already disintegrates. And if you if you want to really exploit this, um, uh, I believe that what you have to do is, is you use you should use auto second pulses, and we did this, and we see that with auto second pulses, you can also already now you can excite transient resonances. So this is really an avenue to improve the resolution and quite exciting the both resolution the the um, temporal and spatial resolution in CDI. Um, and um, the other interesting aspect is that we don't see any detrimental effects in our X-ray diffraction uh, image compared to other studies. So um, what you see here are the most intense plots for very similarly sized clusters. And this is the radial profile plotted over Q or full period resolution here. And what you can see that the shots where we see the highest transient resonances, there is no modulation or it pretty much follows what would you expect from just a perfect scattering from a perfect sphere, which is the black line underneath here. Um, and we see quite nice signal down to five nanometers. And if you think that we use one nanometer radiation, it's actually not that bad. Um, so what I think what the future is and what we have to do now is uh, really to start looking at elements of interest, such as metals, for example, and um, provide guesses by a simulation, um, look for transient resonances, and just really experimentally explore the transient resonances regions, the, pulse, the ideal duration, pulse duration ideal, photon energy, and things like that, and adapt this to the samples we want to, want to see. So here's an example. So usually after the experiment, you always know better what to do. So if I would do the experiment right now, um, I would go to a thousand uh, electron volt X-ray energy because what you can see clearly here. So here the X axis, this is the valency. So basically the outer shell vacancy number. And on the Y axis, you see the core hole number. And this guy, uh, the, the, the color scale, it shows you the amplification compared to the neutral scattering cross-section. So, uh, first of all, what you can see immediately is that the core hole, just if you create one core hole, it scatters already 10,000 times more efficiently than just the neutral. Um, and then if you have recombination processes which um, um, drive auto-ionization, you, at some point you come into this cascade where every absorbed photon actually drives you into a region with a, with a heavier um, scattering cross-section. So this, is, this seems to be the ideal region and, and it seems that we were actually quite far away from the ideal region at 1500 because the, the cascade is much harder to reach. Um, so now just really briefly, um, the acknowledgements. Um, so this has been a very fun collaboration. Um, I will just um, name uh, kind of the main players here. Um, Stefan Kuschel, who was doing the analysis. Um, uh, uh, Fei, Fei, Fei Ho, who, who performed the simulation. And then Argo Marinelli and his team, who provided us with the, with the sub-femtosecond pulses and made this really systematic study uh, possible. And last but not least, um, I would like to show you some of our most recent results. Results are only uh, a month old, um, where we used imaging with uh, attosecond heart X-ray pulses, and um, we were uh, inspired by by three publications. So first of all, there was um, this publication by Anton Klassen, um, uh, Kartik Aya, Henry. Chapman, Ralph Rosberger, and Johan Konstantin predicted that two photons interference 
um, can actually provide really uh, significant advances in X-ray diffraction. Um, and the idea here was that the uh, pulse duration must be much shorter or shorter um, than the fluorescence lifetime. And in that case, we get radiation which is spatially incoherent but temporally coherent. And this is ideal for two photon interference. Um, so we got really intrigued um, and thought this might be really interesting for material science. I have to mention that there is, of course, um, um, other people who, who pursue photon, um, uh, multi-photon uh, 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 interference, but this is from elastically scattered photons, so this is something else. Um, and um, just to remind you what two-photon interference is, so two-photon interference is when you have two emitters and each emitter emits a single photon. Um, and you have, let's assume you have two detectors. Uh, now, if, the, uh, uh, if you cannot distinguish the two pathways, basically, if the photons go in just parallel or they cross each other, which is the case that if they are temporally coherent, um, then what you get is you get interference. Every time in quantum mechanics you have two indistinguishable pathways, you get interference. Um, and this is not a first order interference effect as you used to just from a young double cell experiment. This is a second order interference. So this is a, um, uh, you, you, you need to cross correlate many pairs and look for the basically um, deviations on the average um, or it's in, 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 in uh, strict terms, it's called the G2 function. So second order coherence function. Um, and if you do the math and you cal calculate this, you will get a term which um, uh, has a cosine R function and R is the distance between the emitters. And this is basically the same as in coherent diffraction. So similarly to coherent diffraction, Two photon interference carries structural information about the sample. And what got really, uh, what really intrigued us also that people started using this method for um, uh, metrology. So here is work which, is, um, which has been conducted at Zakla by Chiro Inoue uh, and his team. Um, and they looked at uh, X-ray fluorescence um, in the, which was created uh, by foil placed in a nanofocus, um, and um, they um, um, with, with that, what you get is basically if you look at the uh, at the fluorescence shot to shot, and and you calculate G two, you will get an image of your spot of the of the FEL spot size, and this is um, um, really interesting because it's extremely hard to really directly know and and measure. Um, how large or small your nanofocus is. And they cross-checked it um, with a wire scan, which you can see here. So they focused and defocused. So they were uh, going along the railing length. Um, and then they measured, uh, they, they performed the fluorescence measurement and comp compared it with the wire scan, which are these uh, green diamonds here. And it, it was agreeing overall very well. Um, in both directions. The, the big advantage of this approach is that um, you, you do this shot to shot, so you are not um, affected by jumps or offsets um, similar to, which is, for example, a problem for waveform measurements. So you really, you image in the Fourier space, so this is always in the center. And another additional benefit is that you can use the same technique to measure the pulse duration because again, the contrast of this image will decay if the pulses are longer. And Ichiro and his colleagues they estimated that Zakla has 10 femtosecond pulses based on this, on the contrast of the images. So um, once we heard that there are attosecond hard X-ray attosecond pulses out there, we thought we would want to use this um, and really try to quantify how long or short these are. So we went to, to LCLS to CXI. We had a very similar setup um, as uh, Ichiro's team. So we had a metal foil. We illuminated this with a single sub femtosecond pulses and recorded the image on a Jungfrau detector. And what we observed was quite interesting. So we, we could me uh, uh, measure that there is a slight 
uh, astigmatism along the, the, the path. This is at least what our preliminary uh, analysis tells us. It might still change. So as you see, this is really fresh. Um, so what you see here is what we think the Rayleigh length should be or the nominal Rayleigh length. And this is um, G2 calculated from the positions, different positions of the metal foil based on the fluorescence detector, which was placed downstream here. And you can see this spot, the spot size, how it first elongates, then it becomes roundish, and then it rotates by 90 degrees. This is what you would expect when you have a slight astigmatism. Uh, we could estimate roughly the, the focus size. And based on the contrast, we could already tell that the pulses are really short. Um, the contrast is a little bit lower than we would expect it, but we have another tool. We combine the measurement with a spectrometer further downstream, so this, this definitely needs a deeper analysis. However, if you want to repeat this, a word of caution, you really have to make sure that you don't undersample. So we did a similar measurement with a nickel foil, so this is vanadium, and um, there's a fa only a factor of 1.7, I believe, <clears throat> in wavelength, um, but it was enough to undersample. And with nickel, we did not see all those beautiful effects, which were clearly reproducible with vanadium over multiple days. Um, this is um, um, just the acknowledgement slide. Um, this was a remote experiment. We could not have done this without the CXI and XPP team. So they are the real heroes. Uh, we were, so the uh, our team, um, we were mostly just, you know, giving precious advices and, and analyzing the data. Um, so Felix uh, simulated a lot, pre-simulated a lot about of this um, um, uh, parameter space. So he did quite a few work, uh, quite an effort so that we, we understand what we are doing. And then uh, we had we tried also to to um, image some samples. So this this analysis is still ongoing. But um, from my side, many thanks to Karina and Robert, and then also the PSI team uh, who provided us ratings. And I just wanted to mention that if you're interested in what we're doing and you're looking for a PhD or postdoc position, so we will have uh, new positions open soon. Please contact me. And with that, that's it. Hello. For for the great talk, I'm now the the session is open for questions. I remind to the audience that you can post your questions in the Q and A. Uh, and I don't see questions for now, but uh, maybe I can start with the questions. Can you hear me? Thais, can you hear me? Okay, I I heard from the backstage that we have some audio problem with uh, with Thais, and uh, I would use this moment again to to remind to the audience and encourage to post questions. Ah. Hi, I'm um, back. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Hi, Thais. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. That that's great. Yeah. And uh, so I can start maybe with, with the question concerning uh, uh, again your uh, the first part of your presentation concerning uh, the the employment of uh, transient resonances and in charged uh, samples. That is really really great and and, and impressive. The only thing that maybe I lost, I I completely check, uh, catched the the difference and the, the improvement between the 200 femtosecond and the 5 femtosecond, but I I didn't get uh, what you really gain from the 5 femtosecond to the sub femtosecond. Oh yeah, so this is a little bit of an unfair comparison <clears throat> because the we use the 5 femtosecond pulses in a different regime. So we used the, uh, the sub femtosecond pulses. Uh, the highest photon energy we used was 740 eV. 
Okay. But the real transient resonance of this cascade, they start only at 1500 EV. And uh, at that time, um, XLEAP did not, so the sub femtosecond um, pulses, they did not go up above 1000. So this is why we could not record the same thing with sub femtosecond pulses, unfortunately. So it's an unfair comparison. But it is, I think, really important to note that in the end, if you really, uh, if you want to increase the brightness of the images, I believe that in the hard X-ray regime or even like in a tender regime, sub femtosecond will be necessary to beat damage, especially for really small samples. So this is why I wanted to point out that we clearly see that with sub femtosecond pulses, you can reach um, um, uh, you you can reach uh, a transient resonances in general. This is possible. Clear. Yeah. Thank you. I don't see for now other questions in the Q and A. Maybe a really brief last last question concerning your uh, the last part of your talk. The the we about what you said uh, to, to exploit the, the, the G2. And, yeah. uh, so the, the, that's really great. It's, it's, a, it's a really clever idea. I was wondering if, uh, if there is a price that you pay in terms of the signal or in terms of resolution with respect to conventional diffraction. Yeah, so this is not, I would say this is not entirely clear at the moment. Um, it's also, it cannot be, so I, I don't see a way how you could combine this with single shot atomic uh, resolution, because what you need is for atomic resolution, no matter what method you use, you need multiple photons per atom, which are scattered. Um, so is it coherent or incoherent? It doesn't matter. So, but once you, once you, uh, basically get one fluorescence photon out of the atom, you will not get a second one with the same wavelength. So this is, this is kind of, in my eyes, the ultimate limit. There might be ways around it, but this is um, what I see as the major challenge. And then there's a reason why people use coherent diffraction. It, it reduces the um, um, degrees of freedom with incoherent diffraction, you have additional degrees of freedom, which you need to solve through statistics. So what I think will be most the most promising uh, thing is to combine CDI with with IDI, something like that, for example. I see. Um, and um, uh, maybe maybe there are other clever ways, but I think it's just really exciting new idea which we should pursue. And even just as a metrology um, uh, kind of approach, I find this very exciting because you can measure the pulse duration, out of second pulse duration, without a pump probe setup, which simplifies. So this is like the, the easiest way I know how you can measure pulse duration and your focal spot size at the same time. So I don't know of any other method. Um, and um, so this is why we were, this was kind of our focus to pursue this and see um, if we if we go into the regime that um, the fluorescence lifetime is much shorter, uh, that the pulses are already much shorter than the fluorescence lifetime, um, what kind of effects we will see? Because even that is not clear. The statistics is not clear of fluorescence photons, yeah. like the deep quantum questions. Um, so that's, I, I think it's really exciting. Thank you. And there is a last question by, by Daniela. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the great talk, Thais. These are really exciting pathways to make single molecule imaging work. I'm wondering what is the reason the vanadium target worked for focus characterization while the nickel didn't. You said under sampling? Yes. So we, um, if you do the math, and this works equally for coherent or incoherent imaging. So um, if you look basically at your field of view of your detector, which is limited by the pixel size. So our field of view was all with nickel was a, a, a little bit smaller than the focus. And that means that your signal is already smaller than one pixel. And that means you cannot resolve it. You cannot resolve signals which are smaller than a pixel. Um, so this is, a, this is kind of a serious problem. And this affects the, 
um, the contrast and uh, you see much less features. So in our case, the contrast dropped immediately by over an order of magnitude. And this was kind of, it was really un unexpected because I thought that it's, I did not expect that it's that dramatic and that just a factor of like not even two in wavelength will make the difference, but it did. And um, we did the same thing with titanium and um, it was, yeah, it was uh, surprisingly dramatic. Maybe, maybe there's something else we don't understand. Again, the data is really fresh, but yeah. So I, I think no matter what, the, the, the biggest factor is the undersampling. Thank you very much, Thais. Um, we have no time for other questions. Uh, I mean, but a reminder that we'll have the, the breakout rooms for after lunch for further discussion. So thank you very much, Thais, again, for the great talk. And we can proceed with the last talk. Thank you. Of the, session. the next speaker will be Susanna Papa. Hi, Susanna from Eli Alps. Hello. And uh, she will tell us about ultra fast probing of electron states after plasmon excitation. So please, yeah. the stage is yours. And that's right. Thank you very much for the introduction. So this approach is uh, different uh, than the ones uh, which were introduced by Daniel and Thais, but uh, I still hope that you will find it interesting. But uh, before going into the details, I would like to say a few words about my research institute. So I'm from the Eli Alps. It's a quite new research institute located in Szeged, Hungary. And the Eli Alps stands for Extreme Light Infrastructure at the Second Light Pulse Source. So it is actually a user facility which provides femto and at the second pulses and uh, various end stations to international users to investigate different electromagnetic processes in atoms, molecules, or solid state systems. And since it's a user facility, uh, everyone can apply for beam time. So this is our homepage where you can find all the details about the application and uh, about our infrastructure. And uh, within this research institute, I'm the part of the ultrafast nanoscience group. And our tasks in this group is to perform experiments with the various nanosystems together with user groups. And we also provide nanofabrication support for facility users in terms of electron beam lithography and focused ion beam, and uh, also the numerical simulations to support these results. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, our results uh, regarding a plasmonic system. So the plasmons are the collective electron oscillations bound to metal dielectric interfaces and a very common setup to uh, generate surface plasmon polaritons uh, contains a glass prism, which is coated by a thin layer of gold. And if such a sample is illuminated from the backside uh, by a laser pulse, for example, then under certain circumstances, a very effective energy transfer can be achieved between the light and the, the electron system of the gold layer. During this plasma excitation process, very energetic electrons can be generated. And these energetic electrons uh, attracted much attention during recent years since uh, they are in various applications like solar, energy harvesting or H2O splitting, for example. But uh, to really uh, exploit these uh, hot electrons or these energetic electrons, what we have to know about them is uh, their available energy levels, their exact energy levels and their lifetime. So in principle, what we would like to know electron distribution function of this system. Uh, 
So the electron distribution function of uh, a room temperature system looks like this. So below the Fermi energy level, most of the electronic states are occupied and above the Fermi energy level, they are unoccupied. And for a room temperature system, this electron distribution function can be expressed with this Fermi Dirac distribution function. And what we would like to know, how this electron distribution function will change during the different processes of this plasmon excitation and decay, which involved photon absorption, the generation of the, these energetic electrons, these electrons then interact among each other, then they interact with the phonon subsystem. So we would like to follow how this electron distribution function changes during these processes. And uh, what we can do is that uh, as uh, the electron occupancies change, so does the dielectric function. So there is a connection between the imaginary part of the dielectric function and uh, this electron distribution function which tells us that uh, if we are able to measure the dielectric function, then we can gain information about the electron occupancies as well. And uh, a very broadly applied technique to measure the dielectric function is the spectroscopic ellipsometry. So it, it's a simple reflection-based technique where we measure the changes in the polarization state upon reflection and uh, from this information, we can determine the optical properties and the structure of the investigated system. So in a very simple ellipsometric setup, we have a broadband light source and the light is guided through some polarizing elements, a polarizer and the wave plate. And after the reflection, its polarization state is analyzed with another polarizer called analyzer. And from the detected intensity signal, we can deduce the changes in the polarization state. And based on this uh, uh, data, we can deduce the dielectric function. So if uh, we are able to measure this dielectric function in a time resolved way, then we will be able to determine the electron distribution function also in a time resolved way. So uh, our goal is to gain information about the transient electron energy levels by measuring the dielectric function in a time resolved way. And uh, to carry out such a measurement, what we need is a pump probe ellipsometry setup so here uh, on the right side, you can see uh, the schematic uh, layout of such an ellipsometric setup. So here we have a laser source providing ultra short laser pulses. And the part of these laser pulses are guided through a delay line. And then it is focused onto this uh, plasmon example. So for the plasmon excitation in Kretschmann geometry, as I have already shown, we have to illuminate this sample from the backside. And then with this pump beam, we can generate plasmons on the top side of the gold layer. So the other part of uh, this uh, laser beam is focused uh, onto a dielectric plate where a continuum white light generation happens and then this broadband and the still short light pulse is guided through a conventional ellipsometric setup and with this we can probe the changes in the dielectric function of the gold after uh, given time delays uh, after the, the pumping. So such a setup is available at the Eli Beamlines facility in the Czech Republic. So we took part on a measurement campaign there. And uh, we could measure the changes in the dielectric function 
with about 100 femtosecond temporal resolution. And the pump photon energy here is 1.55 eV, while the probe photon energy after this continuum generation ranges from 1.7 to 3.5 eV. And with this setup, we were able to measure the changes in the dielectric function. So here I plotted the changes in the imaginary part of the dielectric function compared to the room temperature uh, gold layer. So this is the data, what we could measure. And uh, OK, it's not so simple to record such data sets, but uh, the more complicated part is uh, to explain and to interpret this data. So in the next uh, part, I will tell you how we could interpret these changes in the dielectric function. So for this, I would like to go back to this expression. And I would like to explain uh, each part of uh, this expression in a bit more detail. So uh, the imaginary part of the dielectric function first contains the intrabar, intra band uh, contribution. And uh, in this schematic uh, figure, the intraband uh, transition is uh, shown with this uh, solid line. And uh, these transitions uh, have uh, a low uh, photon energy related to our uh, probe photon energy range. So they do not have a very large contribution in our uh, signal. So let's see the other part, which belongs to the interband transitions. And if we consider uh, the photon absorption, because this uh, imaginary part of the dielectric function is connected to the absorption properties of the investigated material. So upon the absorption of the photon with a given energy, we have to take into account uh, the state pairs, which uh, are at the distance of uh, this photon energy, and it will depend on the band structure. So this blue term here is uh, the joint density of states, and it will tell us uh, the available uh, state pairs. So uh, the relevant transitions for our investigated photon energy range are located around the X and uh, the L points in the Brillouin zone. And uh, by taking into account uh, the properties of these trans transitions, we could calculate this joint density of states. And the other thing what we need uh, to get our photon absorbed is uh, that uh, we need that uh, the upper band state uh, should be empty. And this is what this one minus Fe term will tell us. So this is the probability. So in the next step, we should discuss how this Fe curve uh, looks like during the different processes uh, which are involved in this plasmon excitation and decay. So I will show you in this slide the different processes. So as I have already shown before the excitation, we have a room temperature system. So in this case, the electron distribution function can be described with the room temperature Fermi Dirac distribution. And uh, when the photon is absorbed, then this function will be perturbed and the location or the position of these sites uh, is expected to be in a distance which is equal with the photon energy. And this happens in a 10 femtosecond time scale. So after that, in a 100 femtosecond time scale, what we see is that uh, the electron temperature is increased due to the electron-electron interaction. So in this case, this Fermi Dirac distribution will have uh, much 
smaller slope. And uh, after that, in a few picosecond range, there will be an intermediate state when these energetic electrons interact with the phonon sap system. And in this case, in some literature, it is uh, said that uh, near the Fermi energy, a step-like behavior can be observed of this uh, electron distribution function. And finally, after some tens or hundreds of picoseconds, the lattice will thermalize and our system will end up in a bit higher temperature than the room temperature, but the electron and the lattice subsystem will have the same temperatures. So these are the different uh, behaviors of uh, the electron distribution function, what we expect during these uh, plasmon excitation and decay procedure. So the steps during which we would like to evaluate our measured data are the following. So we first, we would like to simulate the electron distribution curves, uh, which expect it to belong to the different processes. Then we calculate the induced changes in the dielectric function. And uh, as a last step, we will compare these changes with the measured ones. But for uh, doing the first step to have a really sound simulations regarding the electron distributions, we have one more ingredient which is needed. And this is the exact temperature of the electron and the lattice subsystem uh, throughout this process. And for this, we applied the two temperature model. So this uh, contains uh, coupled uh, differential equations uh, containing the heat capacity values of the electron and uh, the lattice uh, subsystem we have to know the electron thermal conductivity. There is a coupling factor between the different subsystems. And we also have a source term, which will provide us uh, the, the laser parameters. And uh, we carried out this simulation in one dimension. Uh, so in, in the depths of our gold layer, because the pump uh, beam diameter is much larger during our experiments than the probe. So it is expected that we probe homogeneously a pumped area and therefore it was enough to consider just uh, one dimension. And uh, these are the resulting temperature curves. So as a function of the time, you can see the expected temperature of the electron subsystem and the lattice. And what we can see that right after the excitation, the electron temperature will suddenly increase. And uh, after that, it will decrease. And uh, finally, it will reach a common temperature with the lattice. And if we zoom in to this first few hundred femtoseconds and concentrate only the temperature of the electron subsystem on the top and the, the bottom of the gold layer, we can see that uh, there is a slight change uh, within the layer only in the first 200 femtoseconds. So after 200 femtoseconds, there is no need for a temperature gradient because after that, the whole layer can be handled with a single electron temperature. And with this, we have all the ingredients to do the evaluation. So in uh, the next slides, what I will show you is uh, on the left panel, the measure changes in the dielectric function at different time instants. On the right panel, the simulated changes in the dielectric function. And I will compare these changes to the room temperature uh, dielectric function of the gold layer. So before the excitation, it is just a 
straight line at zero. And I will also show you the expected temperatures and uh, the corresponding uh, distribution function. So our first time instant is 100 femtosecond. And the, here you can see some small structures in uh, the changes of the dielectric function. And to reproduce this, uh, we assumed a slight changes here at uh, positions at uh, plus minus uh, 0 0.75 EV distance from the Fermi energy level due to the absorption of our photons and the simulated um, changes in the dielectric function uh, have similar structures, but now the, the signal levels are very low in this time instant. So I go forward and uh, our next time instant is a 600 femtosecond when we can obtain a much larger signal. And based on the temperature calculation here, we have to use an electron temperature about 700 degrees Celsius. And considering this electron temperature and calculating the electron distribution function, we could reproduce quite nicely the measured changes in the dielectric function. The next time instant uh, is the green curve at two picosecond. So what we can see here is that uh, the amplitude is somewhat lower. And uh, to reproduce this measured curve, we considered 300 degree electron temperature. And we also took into account uh, slight changes near the uh, Fermi energy due to the electron phonon interactions. And uh, again, the simulated curve is in good agreement with the measured one. And the final uh, time instant, what I would like to show you, belongs to 150 picosecond. And uh, in this case, the electron and the lattice uh, have this, this, the electron subsystem and the lattice have the same temperature and uh, based on our temperature simulations it is about 100 degrees Celsius and if we consider this in the uh, Fermi Dirac distribution we can again have a very similar simulated change in the dielectric function as the measured ones and uh, with this, I would like to summarize these results. So I hope that I could convince you that by determining the imaginary part of the dielectric function of the investigated system, we are able to identify different processes. In this case, in the plasmon uh, excitation and decay with 100 femtosecond temporal resolution. And uh, in this, uh, temporal, uh, with this temporal resolution, what we could identify, so they are mo mostly thermal effects. And the, to see the non-thermal processes involving really hot electrons, uh, which do not follow the Fermi Dirac distribution, we need a better temporal resolution. And right now we is working uh, uh, to establish a setup which will provide us uh, sub 10 femtosecond temporal resolution and with this we hope we we will able to see the non-thermal processes as well and during this measurement campaign we measured similar data on plasmonic nanostructures but they are more rich and uh, yeah we we have to work a lot to really understand these transient signals belonging to plasmonic nanostructures and uh, I would like to thank uh, the collaborators of this work, both from Eli Alps and from Eli Beamlines, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Stuck. Thank you very much, Susanna. Maybe I was muted uh, for the nice talk. And uh, now the session is open for, for questions. 
I encourage the audience to, to ask questions. Maybe I can start with uh, with one. I'm I'm not an expert of uh, this type of uh, uh, systems, but uh, now at the end of the talk, you were commenting uh, about the interplay between uh, thermal and non-thermal effects. And uh, indeed, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I I would expect that uh, all the um, slow thermal effects are mostly mediated by by the phonons but the but the plasmonic response is in uh, itself the decay itself of the plasma is expected to, to be much faster right what, what is the bandwidth of the other plasma that you so in this case the the processes of this dephasing when when the generated plasma starts to decay is in the order of 10 femtoseconds. So we really need a better temporal resolution to see the, the direct effect of the plasmons. So right now, what we can follow is that we generate the plasmons and uh, when they decay, uh, their energy is given first to the electron subsystem. And that's why we can see this elevated electron temperature after a few hundred femtoseconds, but we cannot see the direct effect of, of this plasmonic dephasing, which, which happens in, in, in the 10 femtosecond uh, time steps. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Majet. Thanks for the nice talk. Could you eventually probe in the interband region? Yeah, so actually what we are doing is our pump uh, has a 1.5 EV uh, photon energy, which belongs to the intraband uh, excitation. And this intraband excitation is probed by, uh, by this uh, larger photon energy uh, probe beam and with the probe beam what we probe actually is uh, the interband contribution so our the photon energy range of our probe beam uh, covers the photon energy range which belongs to the uh, inter, yeah, interband uh, contributions I see. And maybe following up this question uh, concerning the your direction of uh, increasing the temporary solution, and uh, will you keep the, the pumping scheme uh, around 800 nanometer, or you will have uh, more tunability? Yes, so for the first trial, uh, we would like to stick to this uh, photon energy range, so we have access to ultra short laser pulses with the, the same central wavelengths but with the six femtosecond uh, pass duration and uh, uh, a very broad spectral range and with this we hope that we will be able to see the same uh, spectral features but with a much better temporal resolution okay Good. I would say that uh, we have to, to close the session. Thank you again, Suzanne, and all the speakers for this session. Now we will have the, the, lunch, the lunch break, and after that we will have uh, the discussion and with the speakers in the breakout rooms, the poster awards, and the closing remarks. So see you later and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you.